As a lifelong resident of Lake Forest and Lake Bluff, Ryan London brings a deep knowledge of our local ecosystems, as well as his full understanding of organizations like Lake Forest Open Lands help residents connect locally with nature. Now in his third year as president of Lake Forest Open Lands, he brings 22 years of experience to partner organizations like the History Center. Ryan served as chief product manager for Open Lands' most ambitious restoration and infrastructure project in the organization's history, the Jean and John Green Nature Preserve. In 2019, Ryan was a recipient of the Garden Club of America's Conservation Commendation for his invaluable work promoting the protection, conservation, and appreciation of our ravine ecosystems. And with that, please enjoy the presentation. Thank you, George. Thank you all for coming here. Congratulations on making the right decision for coming in person. I just learned today that there's an internet outage here, so the folks at home would not be able to attend. Um, before we get down into swamping in the ravine, we're going to keep it kind of high level and get to know each other a little bit. You heard some uh, information about me um, on behalf of our Board of Governors, our talented staff, and our dedicated volunteers. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to be with you tonight. And though it's great to see so many familiar faces, I'll share a little bit more about uh, who I am and why I've dedicated my career to this amazing organization. Um, some personal information, both my wife and I are alumni of Lake Forest High School, and we have two sons, one that graduated last year, one that's graduating this year. So we really care about this community. So recently we hired our final spot in the 27th class of our participants in our summer internship program. Now having trained over 170 current and future conservation leaders pound for pound, this program delivers one of the best opportunities in our nation for college students to apply their studies within a community that's steeped in conservation values. And this remarkable program is how I started my story at Lake Forest Open Lands. Sponsored by the Lake Forest Garden Club, I was one of three participants accepted into the program in the summer of 1999, an experience that forever changed my life. My eyes were opened to the power of a community that champions nature. And I've carried that passion of this community's support of Lake Forest Open Lands in my heart during my career. And I've loved working with many partners throughout Lake Forest as we continue to sow the seeds of interest in our wild and special places. So at Lake Forest Open Lands, we believe that nature needs us as much as we need nature. And one of my goals here tonight is to share with you what can happen when we all roll up our sleeves together. As an independently funded conservation and educational organization, we are devoted to preserving and stewarding our incredible local natural landscapes and ensuring that all are welcome and able to fully participate in nature. For 58 years, it's been our privilege to engage and expand our community's commitment to nature and we're thrilled to have preserved over 900 acres of savanna, prairie, wetlands, ravines, and streams. Working with some of the rarest ecosystems found in the entire upper Midwest. And over the last six decades, we've had the active support and guidance from our community, which has allowed us to grow from an all-volunteer organization over 40 years ago when we hired our first employee in 1984. Um, and now we have a staff of 13. We were the first accredited land trust in the state of Illinois, and we've since been reaccredited twice. We're on the verge of our fourth round starting in December. So answering the call to action on conservation issues with innovative solutions has been a core organizational value since the beginning. Our start as a group of concerned neighbors witnessing the loss of prairie and the decline of water quality in our local streams but we worked to solve those problems and began to develop models for conservation and test those programs. And we've shared those lessons learned through our partnerships. We've explored the think outside mindset and approach to community-based conservation and education throughout the region and beyond. This is our Center for Conservation Leadership program out in the Tetons. So wearing your Lake Forest Open Lands hat is truly a badge of honor for being part of something that was started before the very first Earth Day, five years before the Clean Water Act was passed. So in Northeast Illinois, in our part of the county in particular, it has the highest density of rare and unique species found in the entire state. 
We are truly blessed to have this natural fabric as the market to work within, but it's the proven think outside mindset of our community, all of you, which is the enterprise that has and will continue to allow us to make the necessary progress, which I'll talk about tonight with the fabulous story of the ravine. Ravine ecosystems are relic communities. They're windows into the past and they help shape our community. Literally, it's where our roads are. At Lake Forest Open Lands, we see our community as one big connected matrix of habitats. The plants, the birds, the animals, they don't recognize property lines. My predecessor compared Lake Forest to a mini national park. In Illinois, where we have 37 million acres of land and water, we've been able to preserve just over 1.5 million acres. That includes state parks, that includes private conservation, easements. Uh, so that's about 4.2% doing my quick math. Land trusts like Lake Forest Open Lands have been able to preserve 250,000 acres. On the national scale, national parks have been able to preserve about 85 million acres. All the land trust work combined nationally is nipping at the heels. We're at 62 million acres. And we have an ambitious goal of doubling that by 2030. 86% of the United States is privately owned. So this is where we're going to be able to accomplish that goal, working with private citizens, working with philanthropic donors to preserve their values. Land conservation, in my opinion, takes place locally outside of the domes of government, through community-based nonprofit organizations like us, where we provide an opportunity for citizens of all backgrounds to save the places that they need and love through open conversations that empower. Conserving these places through citizen-led community efforts is where we find common ground. So the impact of our work is truly limitless. So, fun fact. Which of these animals has not been found at the Green Nature Preserve at Mort McCormick Ravine? Trick question. They've all been found there. <laughs> I saw a bald eagle circling above my office yesterday. How cool is that? Um, we're starting to see, we're starting to hear less the great horns as they're on the verge of hatching their chicks, and the short-eared on the right. Screech owls, our bluebirds, our rose-breasted grosbeaks, and cliffs, our bank swallows. So it was a lot easier to connect to all that, right, than what I was saying before. It's easy to feel our natural connection to the environment with our furry and our feathered friends. But how do we connect with something even harder to see. How do we connect with something that you can't even see with binoculars? Stories. Stories leverage our ability to connect. They help us simplify overwhelming amounts of information like we just heard. But they also help us find the right windows through. For me, it was that internship here when I was a freshman in college and more depressed than I'd ever been in my life studying doom and gloom environmental studies. For many, it was this picture, Earthrise, taken on Apollo 8. That's that window to connect with the environment. The work of Lake Forest Open Lands and our partner here at the History Center is to preserve and to create those opportunities for the community to experience those same windows through the noise of life today. Whether it's an outing in nature or an exhibit here, it's an important opportunity to experience the past the present and the future all at once. Kurt Miney opens his short essay titled Washed Up on the Shores of Lake Michigan. He's one of the resident leaders at the Center for Humans and Nature right here in Libertyville. He opens this essay as follows. For the Chicago area, the lake is the source of the rising sun. Then it's daytimes spread out sheen of blue or slate or green, and then finally, it's nighttime's void. Just out there beyond the reach of urban lights, it is dark matter, the great pool of mystery amid our familiar. Not easy to connect with. Sometimes we don't even think about it. 
It's impossibly large. 84% of, of the United States' fresh water is in the Great Lakes. 20% of all fresh water on Earth. Green Bay is the largest freshwater estuary on the planet. It's hard to imagine this massive entity that's difficult to engage with as something that could collapse or be frail enough to fail, but it did, and it can again. Ecosystems are always changing, and we humans are powerful agents of that change. The Great Lakes now host some 180 different invasive algae, plants, invertebrate, and fish. We connect through watersheds. This was the wetland capital of the world. Look at all these, and I don't even have the sub-watershed lines turned on. It would look like a spider's nest. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Here's our, we're in the Lake Michigan watershed right now, that little pink band right there. That's it. In Lake Forest, we have three other sub-watersheds, all the, part of the middle, uh, the Chicago River, the North Branch, the Skokie, the West Fork, and the Middle Fork. Historically, the Lake Michigan watershed used to be 673 square miles, though. So that was the historical, plus the pink part that we saw before. It'll be on the next slide. All of that drained those 673 square miles into Lake Michigan via the Chicago and the Calumet River system, and then the coastal bluffs and the ravines. But by 1922, the canals had diverted nearly all of that to the Chicago River and now out to the Des Plaines, the Illinois, and out to the Gulf to alleviate flooding, some sanitary issues, and facilitate cargo. So now it's only 88 square miles. So we went from 673 to 88. So that's 12% of pre-European settlement. And of this, there's about 50 of those 88 acres in Lake County. Those 50 acres drain through 53 ravines. The actual rain that they capture, literally falling straight onto them, is about 1.6 square miles. That's it. So the ravine systems in Lake Michigan occupy this little narrow band, extending the entire length of Lake County, and then a little bit down into uh, Winnetka on the north side of Cook County. In recent years, another invasive species has arrived about every eight months. Some like the zebra mussels we know mainly because they cause noticeable economic damage. There's other disturbances out there that we don't fully understand yet, like all the arm ring on the lakeshore that's occurred over the recent years. I'm gonna tell you a story about the lake trout. The continuous overfishing of many species and unchecked pollution contributed to the disruption of the native fish communities of the Great Lakes. Most of the deepest impacts we'll never, we could never see because they're pelagic species. They are open water species. Literally, there were three closely related endemic species of the deep cold water lake. The long jawed cisco, the black fin cisco, and the deep water cisco. And they swam right into extinction and vanished by the early 60s because of the pollution, because of the changes, because of the changes in the hydrology and the watershed. More appreciable was the actual collapse of the lake trout, which happened over less than a decade. So in 1946, the commercial catch was about 5.5 million pounds. Just seven years later, the total capture was less than 500 pounds. So, so we, had, we lost the latter bait fish species, we lost the primary predator, and the disruption for this change, open the back door for the alewives to come in. Everybody just had a memory unlocked, right? The smell, walking to the beach as a kid. So with the march of the lamprey and the wiping out of the lake trout, the alewives ran away for 20 years, from the late 40s until the 60s, and then we had those big die-offs. Um, and those you know, continued for the next 30, 25 years, but then they went away. When, because in the 50s, they released the Pacific salmon, and it took them that long to catch up to them. Now, I know two years ago, they had a big die off on the east coast of Lake Michigan and Michigan. But for the most part, my kids growing up don't know the alewives. Like, 
when I was growing up. So it's interesting. It's really interesting. In the 50 years since the Clean Water Act was passed in 1972, 83% of freshwater species have declined. So us, knowing how sensitive this massive ecosystem is, we need to be better informed to make judgments when we read these editorials talking about giant straws to California, talking about diversions, talking about algae blooms, talking about running out of groundwater not too far from here. 50 miles. Who here has heard about en Enbridge Line 5? Thank you. So that's the pipeline under the Straits of Mackinac. It transports 22 million gallons a day of oil, and it has leaked up to a million over the years through 33 separate incidents, including an anchor strike in 2018. There's a movie in some theaters out right now about the Bad River Band of the Chippewa on Lake Superior fighting this. Um, I know in Chicago, uh, the theater that's hosting it is ending its run next week. So narrated by Ed Norton, um, it's supposed to be a very powerful movie. We have to know about this stuff. So the story of Lake Michigan helped me think about my relationship with our local environment, to be informed, to be an engaged citizen, to remember those memories, walking from Artesian Park to the lake as a summer and smelling it as soon as I hit the library, looking through that great pool of mystery that Kurt was talking about and, and being more familiar with our coastal community to which we belong. Ecological literacy is another fancy way of saying, think outside. Many of us in the nonprofit world love logic models. We love, you know, the Tarnside curve of awareness, interest, desire, engagement, commitment. Doug Ptolemy, who came and spoke at our annual meeting last year, he simplifies it. Knowledge generates interest. Interest generates compassion. Compassion generates change. That's my goal here tonight. So, ravines, textbooks define ravines as steep-sided V-shaped valleys. They're larger than gullies, but smaller than canyons. We define them as our coastal connection. Literally, Jeannie Green, Jeannie McBride, when she was a child of the Jean and John Green Nature Preserve, told me when she was a kid, they used to the, use the ravines like an underground railroad to come out and play with friends during the polio epidemic. They are our connection. They are our sense of place. This is the mouth of McCormick Ravine in 1978. You can still see some of the airplane hangers there on the left. This is what it looks like today. So ravines contain these perennial and intermittent streams. And they were created by the unique landforms of our most recent, recent glaciation. So all of this information of this section I got from our retired coastal geologist, Mike Churchistowski. Um, so the unique landforms of the moraines, and I'll get into this in more detail, the ravines, the bluffs, the beaches, they were left from a much ancient glacial movement recession called Lake Chicago. Um, and it was a much larger prehistoric lake than what we know as Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan, as we know it, it uh, as today, really was after all the ice was gone. So the Lake Michigan ravines uh, in northern Illinois are mostly all on the Highland Park moraine. Uh, there's some that are on the Zion Beach Ridge Plain as we go further in. Uh, they range from 10 feet to 90 feet, 95 feet in depth, and they can extend inland as much as two miles. So what happened when this ice sheet retreated, um, let's say 10 to 12,000 years ago, the water level in Lake Michigan dropped. So we had the glaciers come down, and then we had them retreat, and then right after they retreated, right in between, right now we consider, when we study the, um, the Army Corps lake levels, Huron and Lake Michigan are the same, they're connected. But at one point, it all drained north, and that's because of isostatic rebound. So the bedrock, was compressed after having a mile of ice, and it essentially drained north and emptied. And it was during that time at the low lake levels 
when these ravines were formed by water, not by the glaciers. They were formed by water um, carving through what the glaciers left. And there's lots of different um, geological forms that I'll go into, uh, like moraines, eskers, drumlins. Mostly here, we're dealing with uh, lake plain ridges and moraines. So you kind of think of, I like when I explain it to children, think of it as a bulldozer with a conveyor belt on the front of it. <laughs> and just picking up whatever it could grab on the way down and leaving it wherever it was when it retreated. After the isostatic rebound came up, that's when we had it sealed off to the north and we have our normal pooling of Lake Michigan as we know it today about 4,000 years ago. So here's a couple different iterations of that. And there was the Kankakee Torrent, and I mean, we, we don't have enough time to go through all of it, but uh, it, lake, the Lake Michigan as we know it today be, began as a proglacial lake, which was dammed with the ice in the front and then the moraines that circle the southern end of the lake. The Glenwood stage was about 55 feet above present level, and the sand ridges on the moraines so when we walk through our ravines and on the top of the bluffs, there's sand up there. Sometimes those sand seams go all the way from the top all the way to the bottom. That's from when that was actually beach. Um, then the lake overtopped that moraine in what's now southwest Cook County and, and rapidly eroded an outlet. Um, they call it the Kankakee Torrent, the Sag Valley, which was nearly a mile wide. That's that bottom right picture there. The Calumet stage was about 35 feet above present level. Blue Island, which is bedrock, um, prevented erosion and stood above the ice. And then the low water Chippewa stage occurred when a temporary outlet opened for the Lake Michigan Huron through northern Ontario. That water, that's that isostatic rebound, pre-isostatic rebound, that's when the lake was 300 feet below present level. So if you go way out there, there's stumps miles out from when trees were growing out there when it was so low. Just a, uh, a very simple diagram of some of the different features. You'll see these throughout the upper Midwest. And this is, this is interesting, that bottom left one, that's how these eskers form, where you have the meltwater actually creating moraines in the middle of the glacier. Ours were more of like a bulldozer at the end. So the drainage area that's the tributary to Lake Michigan is compo currently composed of two physiographic regions. The Zion Beach Ridge Plain, which is what we see here to the north, and then the lake border moraine system that we're in here. So the Beach Ridge goes from Kenosha down to North Chicago, and so if you're driving up the Amstutz and you go past the harbor and you see some of those cliffs on the left, that's actually another moraine. You can see it up there, it's the Zion City Moraine. We're the next one west. That one hasn't been exposed yet. And there's all these dunal swale uh, deposits at Illinois Beach, which by the way, was the first state park in the entire nation. So we we're all connected in a counterclockwise system. It's been explained to me, like think of like a caterpillar working its way down the lake. And so it's sand being picked up and then deposited as you go further south. And then you have the dunal swale systems uh, down in Indiana, and then all of the big dunes where it ends up in Michigan. But that's all kind of been disrupted now. So the lake border, it consists of five north-south trending ridges that are roughly parallel to the lake shore. And so as we go through, those are our river valleys now. It's like you go west and you go down to the Middle Fork and you go back up and you go down to the Displains and you go back up. At its widest, it goes about 10 miles. So Park Ridge, Deerfield, Blodgett, Highland Park, Zion City. And only Highland Park and Zion City are currently within the current Lake Michigan because of that shrink of the, of the watershed that I mentioned before. So Green Bay Road, you can kind of think of as like a mini continental divide that was built right on top of the Highland Park Moraine. So everything east of there, for the most part, goes into Lake Michigan Everything west of there goes to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, 
So as the lake levels rose to their current state, the coastal processes eroded these lakeward slopes and created a lot of sediment, created these bluffs, which were always dynamic systems. Ours is one of the last eroding clay bluffs left in Illinois that's unprotected. So this essentially runs the entire length of Lake County. Over the past four to 5,000 years, the net southward littoral transport, so that's that caterpillar I was talking about, of the sand and the periodic deposition by large storms and waves combined to form the Beach Ridge Plain that's currently protecting the, the Zion City Bluff. Uh, so that's north of Great Lakes. Uh, under natural conditions, this Beach Ridge Plain would continue to migrate southward and eventually re-expose that Zion City Bluff but the construction of Waukegan Harbor and various other types of armoring have temporarily frozen it in time. So we have all these cells. Instead of one big system, we have a bunch of compartmentalized systems. The ravines contribute a ton of sediment to these systems too, and sediment is really important for the fishes and all of the other fauna that we have in the near shore zone. So, you can see there's some people wearing red t-shirts there in the middle of that photo. That's a big sandbar. That came a year after we did the construction project. It just showed up. It came from further up in the system of the ravine. It didn't come from the lake. So prior to European settlement, the Lake Michigan coastal zone was one of the most diverse ecosystems in Lake County. It was a special coastline climate that included dense wooded ravines, savannas, and an array of herbaceous plants uniquely suited to the ravines and the bluff faces. So the plants that were here immediately post-glaciation were able to hang on because of the microclimatological effect of the lake, the moisture, the topography. Plants tend to grow on two gradients, a moisture gradient and a sunlight gradient. And the ravines are about as diverse as it gets around here. The plant community on a north-facing slope is completely different than a south-facing slope. Um, we just don't see that kind of rapid change in diversity as you walk through a site typically here. Plant communities in the ravines are of particular concern because there's so many locally rare and threatened species, as many as 16 present in the ravines. They keep changing the list, so I'm just gonna stay with 16, but it, it might be less now. Um, because of our efforts. So due to the proximity of the lake, that, like I was mentioning, that microclimate has allowed mosses, has allowed fire intolerant plants to hang on. Fire was a major disturbance in our region, but the ravines did not burn as much. They burned, but they didn't burn as much. So some of our woody species, it's really our only uh, community locally that has more of a closed canopy. Some of those species, now I'm gonna go through a bunch of pictures. Common juniper, unfortunate name, but um, incredibly rare plant. We actually collect this from cuttings and, and contract grow it and propagate it around our sites. Um, we've got, this is viola conspersa, dog tooth violet. Partridge berry, so it's an evergreen vine. Does not like fire. Um, you can, that actually, this is a great picture. That fruit there, you can see kind of two little indentations on it. Another common name for this plant is twin flower. It actually starts as two separate flowers and then it forms into one fruit. Um, so those from the Northeast will know um, partridge berry wreaths around Christmas time. People will make little wreaths and, and sell candles with them. Uh, this is another one that we collected seed and we, um, contract grew and, and repropagated, repop, excuse me. Um, Lake Forest Garden Club was a huge help with that. We've got maple leafed viburnum out there and those are the pretty blue fruits. Huckleberry, blooming, so pretty. And the fall color is incredible on this plant too. And this is in the blueberry family. Um, part of our work out there has been to put more sunlight and they never used to flower, and now they're flowering like crazy. It's incredible. Not making enough fruit to bake pies yet, but. Um, this is Lanicera dioica. It's our, one of our two native honeysuckles, 
And um, we're actually working on a study with the Botanic Garden right now, studying pollination effect efficacy. Uh, so they're going out there and they're putting little tea bags around them and measuring how, um, how well they're actually pollinating each other. This is Lanesera durabilla or yellow bush honeysuckle. This is widely used now ornamentally and a, um, a great local species. We've, the amazing part of our ravines is that they're so ancient and they have this intact network of undisturbed history, for lack of better words. You can have hemiparasitic plants like Indian pipe, Monotropa uniflora out there. So, and it's, its cousin, which is called pine sap. These only exist in really high quality, undisturbed relic communities. Um, the yellow trout lily, most of us know the white one. And then this plant is really interesting. Not a great picture. I've taken, these are all my pictures, but you can kind of see a white flower to the left starting to just close up. This is um, Trientalis borealis, or star, northern star flower. And this plant tends to switch to a vegetative reproduction. It doesn't necessarily need to make seed. And so when you think about resiliency and you think about climate change, and we think about stewarding these isolated communities, it's important to know really what we have because as they mature, as we go through evolutionary biology and, um, and genetics, it's possible with a plant that just sends out nodes and not really cross pollinates that they can all essentially be the same DNA. So we went through and DNA tested every single one of our plants, all 435 of them, uh, with Roosevelt University to determine how much gen genetic diversity we really have and do we need to be swapping seed with other locations. The next closest location of this plant is Volo Bog. Um, the Robin Moran, so a famous botanist that did a lot of the groundwork from Southern Illinois University. Um, he did the ravines, he did the prairies, he really kind of gave us the data to, um, to, to chart our course as an organization as far as Lake Forest Open Lands goes. His notes on ravines in the Michigan botanist paper that he wrote said found on one north facing slope in an Illinois ravine, which is McCormick Ravine. Um, this is a great plant. This is Carex pensilvanica or pensedge, oak sedge, one of the primary stabilizers we planted over 195,000 of these on the slopes out there um, with the Army Corps Restoration Project. Great plant, deer don't really like it. Uh, and then we've got zigzag goldenrod, Solidago flexicollis, great woodland uh, species. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the different habitats that we have in the ravines. So the streams for the most part are confined to the channels that dissipate their energy in the ravine floor and the banks until they reach maturity and have developed floodplain terraces. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is a textbook example of floodplain terracing. So you have the switchbacking of the stream and on the inside bends, you have the point bars of the sand forming, forming and then the deep water on the other side. So I can just imagine there's frogs over there and turtles digging around in the sand there. Um, at its widest in this section of McCormick Ravine, it's over 500 feet wide. So that's, that's really what we, what we think of as a, a, a ravine all grown up rather than some of the ones that we know around town that are just kind of deep V's and, and naked almost. They don't even have plants growing in them. Skunk cabbage. So skunk cabbage was in the bottom of this one here. So that's a plant that needs to grow on a seep where there's water moving, groundwater. So these ravines are kind of a hodgepodge, these moraines that the glaciers left, they're a hodgepodge of um, material, glacial till. Sometimes it's sand, sometimes it's gravel, sometimes it's big boulders that are four feet tall. It's whatever it grabbed, and sometimes it's rock hard clay. And so where you have a layer of clay, almost like a, a pond liner, and then you have a bunch of gravel or sand, that water, as it works its way through, Sheridan Road's at elevation 695. 
Lake Michigan is at elevation 580 on average. So you have 115 feet of elevation drop of all that groundwater working its way out. Where you have a seep is where you have a layer of clay and a layer of very porous gravel or sand on top of it. And that's where that groundwater squirts out. And it never freezes. I've stepped up to my knee accidentally through the snow in a seep that I didn't know was there. And that's where the skunk cabbage grows. And so this plant is amazing. This year, I found it blooming on February 8th, which is the earliest I've ever seen it. Um, it can actually create its own heat and melt the snow as it comes up. And it's fly pollinated. And so this hood, that's the actual flower there, um, is kind of smells like carrion and it attracts flies, those early flies that hatch. And that's how it's pollinated. Incredible plant. And it's actually where we, where we got our name uh, for Chicago. It's where the skunk root grows. It's where not stinking onion as we were taught in school. Um, so a lot of text here, I'm sorry, but these are the different areas. And so we talked about bluff and the eroding bluff. We talked about seeps. These are dynamic systems as they mature and go from those steep Vs to wider areas. We have slumps. Those are actually a community because you think about if anybody's ever canoed up north and you see the birch and the juniper literally growing out of a rock, that's a special trait for a plant to be able to grow out of really heavy mineral conditions. Most of our plants around here really wanna have organic nutrients, but the ravines are full of plants like sarsaparilla, uh, birch, and the juniper that can grow out of very little organic material, just out of rock, hard clay, and that's what colonizes those slides, like uh, number eight there. It's just a little map of the various communities that we have out at Green. So we've got the plateau or the tableland where it's flat up top. The slopes, and like I said, the north facing slope is a different community from the south facing slope. And then we've got essentially these wetlands down in the bottom. We also have the littoral zone which is the near shore and right along the shore. Dunes, marum grass, incredibly important species, not only for habitat, but for stabilization and keeping sand. We've got the bluffs, we've got the cavalry. <laughs> I'm hoping we're gonna see beaches like that. Again, it's been a while. Uh, the streams that I mentioned, seeps, slumps, but even the, all the magic that we have in places like McCormick and all the wonderful ravines, they still need our help. These remnant parcels of natural community types are under immense pressure from the continued human activities. So these include um, fire suppression, like I mentioned, the altered hydrology, you know, draining all of our roads through these ravines the increased colonization of invasive species and the, the pressure from fragmentation of urbanization. So this was a sl slope that we actually revegetated as part of the Army Corps project and it's all full of care expensive manica and green again. We had crazy ideas. I, I put a table back there of the old McCormick estate plan and they put dams and lily ponds and mounds in there we ripped all that out. We ripped out 600 cubic yards of concrete and 300 cubic yards of those pipes. I actually brought a section of that pipe over here. I turned it into a paperweight, but pick it up on your way out. I don't know how they even got those in there, um, you know, pre-steam, pre-diesel, four inches thick. So the development of the land surrounding the ravines has greatly accelerated the pace of those geological forces that actually formed them in the first place. So in, in a sense, the, the ravines are actually getting younger than older. Um, you know, we've, 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 we're preventing groundwater recharge. We're seeing an increased rate of incision. We're seeing more mass head cutting. We're seeing bad ideas fail more often than not. Oh, we have an amazing community that says we can instead of we can't, and recognizing the potential of a clean slate project like McCormick in the Green Nature Preserve, we took our time recognizing it took 100 years to really get this bad 
we have some time to get it right. So this was actually the original proposal uh, for the McCormick Park. Um, I think this is 1934. I can't really read it. Um, what, we were, what we were able to save was most of it. Um, so 61 acres. I think originally it was going to be just over 300 uh, before the Villa Turcum development. But there, the way this happened was starting in, in, in the late 70s with the Lake Forest Garden Club, right when the coastal management zone was created, uh, we wrote the very first grant to plant trees out there and slowly just labored along doing monitoring, doing invasive species removal. But what accelerated it was the symposium in 2008, the Ravine Symposium, which was kind of on the, on the tails of the Chelsea um, exhibit um, that Lake Forest Garden Club won that I believe it was a silver award for. Um, and, and right after that, we had a, just kind of a, a, a massive awakening on ravines. Um, and that put us on the map. We started getting the attention of some federal and state supporters in 2011, when the National Conference for Land Trust was held in Milwaukee, we had field trips uh, down here. And then we started the Lake Forest Collaborative for Environmental Leadership, which received another Coastal Management Zone grant and a lot of literature and engagement and events and basically built the political capital that we needed to achieve this project. So I'll quickly talk about what we did with the project, removing some of that failed infrastructure regrading some of those cultural disturbances to the topography out there and then restoring it with vegetation and, and phase two with some of the infrastructure as well. Lots of tree removal. We removed over 2,000 trees, a lot of dead ash, but we removed some native trees too. Uh, sugar maples, uh, red oaks, if they were too dense. Um, we studied the canopy assessment. I basically lived out there for three months um, every day cruising the slopes. And we, st we, we tagged it and we geo-referenced it, made some really interesting heat maps, but it was backbreaking work because we had to do it all by hand. Um, we did repurpose a lot of it for boardwalks and stuff with Eagle Scouts. Um, like I said, those pipes were heavy and big and massive. I, you couldn't even break them with a sledgehammer. Um, so if anybody remembers, that's what it used to look like when you were down there on the bridge. Um, we kind of we had to rebuild the bottom of the ravine back up. So there was um, stone in the bottom and um, bedding stone, and then we had three foot diameter um, limestone blocks underneath each weir, and that's a weir right there in the bottom, a course of of stone. So the idea here was to stabilize these things, revegetate them and have them navigable with fish. So fish need cool um, refuge and clear running water. And McCormick is one of the few ravines that runs year round because of all that groundwater. Um, they need uh, refuge from predators, so little deep pools. So we put 12 of these fish ladders uh, across the final 600 feet of, of stream bottom. And that's where the fish will hang out during the low periods uh, they tend to migrate in and out during the storm. So this picture here is taken at the same angle as that picture. It's the same exact spot. You can see that bend. Um, we also use nature-based solutions to do some stabilizing. So the idea is all of these features are natural. We saw way too many, fail we've seen too many failed civil um, techniques, whether metal sheet piles or gabions, we wanted it to be habitat related. So snakes, chipmunks, plants can actually grow in all those cracks. And when eventually 50, 60, 75 years from now, when they start to crumble, it'll be natural habitat. Here's just a couple, I'm gonna go through these quick. Um, pictures of the same angle throughout the project. That was removing a big dam. Another before and after. And then this was planting those hundreds of thousands of plugs, which we took up most of the native plant nurseries 
in Northern Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin for this project. We did um, reintroduce fire. So we had a couple prescribed burns out there. One wildfire that was an escape fire in fall of 2020 that was not us. Um, but the plants came back very quickly. Here's Lanicera right after the fire the next spring. Here's the huckleberry uh, re-blooming. And by July, they were the same height as they were before. It was incredible. I was actually a little worried. Um, we had steelhead the very first fall after this project was done. So protecting our lands and waters is a public health issue. When we save nature, we save ourselves and our success completely relies on our ability to continue to weave the spectacular landscape of Lake Forest within our everyday lives, through our work, through our conversations like tonight, and through time in nature. And so time in nature was phase two of this project. We wanted to make it accessible. Um, we hired, I, I, I interviewed a lot of local designers, engineers, um, and I, I wasn't comfortable with um, the conventional approach uh, to nature preserve trails. We really needed to do, needed a skill set and some competencies of folks that have worked in the most sensitive areas in the country. And so we hired Larry Knudsen, who wrote the Universal Access Shared Use Guidebook, which the Natural National Park Service uses. This is actually his old edition. He came out with a new edition in 2020. Um, so he, he does design work and, and works in areas where there's deed restrictions where they can't even use power tools. Um, so it, basically his approach is design for the few, not for the many. Here's what our trails look like out there. So we have a fully accessible trail from the parking lot all the way to the top of the stairs. Just another perspective on the trail system out there. Uh, we used, this is called turnpike. So instead of the normal forest preserve trails, where they're literally, you know, the impact is twice as wide of the trail as the trail because you have to have, um, you know, gutters and swales and everything. It's all retained with these boulders and very small footprint. And we've had no collateral damage. A lot of boardwalks, beautiful fall colors. That red that you see there is the huckleberry that I was talking about with the fall color. And then the award-winning suspension bridge, uh, which connected a formerly inaccessible Part of the site essentially half of the site was never accessible before and this was all brought in with really small pieces of equipment and piece by piece with the metal almost a mile off the edge of pavement we were um, one of 11 finalists for the top engineering project of the whole state we were up against the jane burn interchange the mile long bridge uh, we were the only privately funded project our project cost was not even a rounding year for most of those projects. Um, so we got two honor awards, but it was pretty cool. I honestly will never probably be invited back to the American Council for Engineering Companies annual gala as an ecologist, but it was pretty neat. Um, we worked within the same footprint for the boardwalks out there. So there's 100 steps. Just know how many before you go down. And with it opening um, just about a year ago this week, uh, we now have a, for, uh, a nature preserve in every ward in Lake Forest, um, one that's within walking distance of every ward in Lake Forest. So what's next? We have still, like I said, we're taking our time. It took 100 years to get that bad. We, we, we have some time, and we need to do some fundraising to continue to make it um, up to snuff, so to speak. So these are our next targets. Additional stabilization. Um, our bluff really uh, had, had a rough go with the high lake levels over the past couple of years. But we took what we learned and we packaged it into what we call our restoration toolbox so that we can really one of the, one of the best benefits of this project has been influencing better projects regionally. We're seeing folks using rounded stone instead of riprap. We're seeing folks using nature-based solutions instead of traditional textbook civil engineering solutions. So working with plants. Uh, I can't tell you how many projects where they ask for our plant list after this. Um, and this has actually helped us get grants. We kind of have a great system in the can uh, ready to go for the next funding opportunity. This is our biggest need right now. Um, it used to be fairly vegetated. There was a couple old pictures 
earlier in the slideshow where we saw what it used to look like, but we kind of ran into a perfect storm of the high lake levels and some armoring as everybody else rightfully protected their own private property and it really diverted a lot of water and energy towards ours. Um, so I apologize, I couldn't do a presentation without some charts, but um, this is where we were in 2020. So we were about two inches off of the high all-time record in 1986, right there in the middle. And in 2014, this is the projection for next year. So we're, we're, we're down, but we're, we're not below where we were in 2020. And this is the all-time chart going back to 1918. So if you look in the middle there, that was 1966, and then it went up into the 70s, and then it came down a little bit, and then it went back up in 1986 there, right in the middle. Right when we started our project, we were almost at the all-time low in 2014. And then, but that took 12 years to go from 66 to 78 to the high. We did it in six, which is a little concerning. Um, it does tend to be one of these sine waves, but nobody really knows. The, there's no crystal ball for what it's gonna do in the future. So we wanna be resilient, we wanna be intentional, but we still wanna have the right example with nature-based solutions and influence better projects. So we worked with NOAA uh, and we worked with the Great Lakes um, Initiative um, and a consultant out of uh, New York called Dewberry. And since last June, we've been coming up with nature-based solutions. Um, and we're actually in for um, a large federal grant. I don't know if we'll get it. My colleagues think we will. They're very optimistic where we can come back and restore our bluff uh, with vegetation, with root wads, and also doing some nearshore reefs for fish habitat, um, which will hopefully do some sand attenuation as well. Really exciting stuff. So what can we do at home? What can we all do? It's really important to plant natives. And I have good news. Uh, the Lake Forest Open Lands annual plant sale shopping cart is opening on April 15th. And then just shortly thereafter, we have uh, Hillary Peters, our Director of Land Stewardship, is going to be doing a whole lecture here on um, native planting in the home and how to manage stormwater and all those things. Who here lives on a ravine? Great. So the, the best thing you can do is create a little buffer. You know, not have your lawn go all the way to the edge. If you have downspouts, don't have those discharge right at the edge. Steward that water down to the bottom of the ravine as much as possible. Plant natives. This I took in my yard yesterday. This is another anomaly this year, and it feels I just had to put this in with the climate change theme. This is my blood root that I've been watching for the past 23 years. I've never seen it bloom this early. Um, it's a pretty little flower. We have tons of these in our ravines. They, luckily, they're not. They have no nectar. They don't need pollinators. They can self-pollinate. Ants do a big heavy lift for them, but our insects are really important. And oh, a single oak tree can support 530 native species of moss and butterflies alone, and hundreds, up to 2,300 other species of birds, mammals, herptofauna, invertebrates, fungus plants, lichens, moss. Native plants are absolutely critical for our planet's building blocks. Our insects pollinate 75% of our crops globally, which is a $577 billion ecosystem service. Dung beetles alone contribute $380 million of ecosystem services in this country. So this is where our next mass extinction is going on. And you wouldn't know it this summer with the cicadas coming, um, but I mean, just look at the scale. You have a million insects versus 11,000 species of birds. It's it's just inc incredible. They're our building block of this planet. And as we all know, monarchs have declined as much as 72% over the last 10 years. Um, so it's really important to do these native plants. If you build it, they will come. I'm gonna skip this one. This is what we're working to balance against. This is a habitat desert. They have their place but it doesn't need to be this much. Um, there's a great account online. He's, he's a botanist, um, but his, his, um, 
His brand is called Kill Your Lawn. <laughs> and I ordered one of his sweatshirts. I'm gonna wear it at our plant sale. I'm, I'm not holding back. This is, this is actually my backyard. It doesn't need to look quite like this. This is a little too much of one species. I don't know what happened that year. <laughs> um, but that was all lawn before. So I know um, we only had an hour and we're just about out of time. Um, but there's lots of different ways to continue this conversation. There's our weekly hikes starting very soon. Check our website, um, birding hikes, Tuesdays on the trails. We have a, a hike with the History Center at the Ravine Project on May 4th. I think that's gonna be really popular, so sign up early. Um, we, we are getting our uh, new accessible wheelchair this year, so that'll be available. Our beloved volunteers, adventuring and restoration uh, are out all the time every Wednesday. Uh, we have Eco Crew the first Saturday of every month. We have some other projects. Um, so my, using that toolbox that I mentioned before and doing uh, coastal monitoring, beach cleanups, rare plant monitoring, trash cleanups. We have our corporate partners. We love our corporate partners. The full protection and complete restoration of McCormick Ravine is an incredible accomplishment. We owe that thanks really to all of you here, the people in the room, the people in the community. We couldn't have done what we've accomplished over the years without you. I want to especially acknowledge the vision of our founders. The land trust movement was barely on the radar screen nationally in 1967. Unfortunately, there was a small but tenacious group of local residents that saw that need and started land preservation. This continues with our programming today. I think this quote sums it up the best. The Senegalese forester uh, in 1968, in the end, we will only conserve what we love and we will only love what we understand. And we will only understand what we are taught. So in closing, Gregory Bateson, you, many of you probably heard me use this quote before, famously said, the major problems of the world are the result of the difference between how nature works and the way that we think. Our solution to bridging those problematic differences is to steward and cultivate that think outside mindset that I spoke of earlier. I know I just very quickly scratched the surface uh, of the ways that you can connect with us. Please come back, like I said, on the 25th of April. Um, or stop by our office. It's membership season, so you can stop by for your membership gift and stay for the sunset. Uh, it's the entire Open Lands team's privilege to continue serving our entire community and our local tradition of ensuring that future generations will always have the same prairies, ravine, ravines, savannas, and streams to experience and explore. And I look forward to seeing all of you down the trail. And I'll hand it over to George for any questions. There is always a new one. You know, we have early invader detection. Uh, there's always something else that's snuck in on a pallet or in somebody's firewood pile. Um, primarily at green, it was um, the buckthorn to start. Um, but we also have things like, if you live in the Villa Turicum neighborhood, you know about Lesser Salandine, that weedy little yellow lawn weed in everybody's lawn that got into the mulch industry about 15 years ago. Um, we have, you know, purple loose stripe out there. We have some of the thistles and phragmites and um, some of the grasses. So it's, yeah, grasses, flowers, uh, and, and the woodies. Great question. The deer, the deer are starting to become a bit of a problem out there. So I, I've become a bit of a red-headed woodpecker expert by accident uh, because 
The ravine site is one of the most dense populations in all of Chicago. And you can actually study their behavior week to week because they're just so easily easy to see out there. And they're great for terrible birders like me that rely on bright red birds. Um, it depends on how, I think the birds are going to benefit the most, but it depends on you know, how large they are. Can they, I just had this conversation with one of our um, bluebird monitors yesterday. I said, can a bluebird choke down a cicada? I don't know. Um, so I think it'll, it'll be a boom uh, for a lot of species. Which uh, city department monitors the ravines that twist through a lot of our residential neighborhoods? That's a great question. So the city of Lake Forest, Again, a separate entity from us. Um, we're, we're a private uh, 501c3. They are very sophisticated on this process. Um, I, I'm just going to really send them some great kudos. This started um, way back when with the Ravine Ecosystem Partnership that the Great Lakes, uh, the Alliance for the Great Lakes kicked off, and they did a lot of baseline data, uh, line data, monitoring, going through the ravines, and grading the outfalls and grading the, where there were log jams and that kind of stuff. And then the city and Lake County stormwater management picked up and they go through and they annually monitor through their public works department. They annually monitor that and then they prioritize, similar to us, they've been really successful at getting grants uh, to support that stewardship work. And so those are the folks that I mentioned earlier that were sharing design typicals and seed lists with and, and really getting community-wide better projects. Um, ravine ownership is not consistent. So for part of McCormick Ravine, it's the center of the water course, which is a very common uh, denominator for um, ownership. Sometimes it's all the way up to the crest on both sides. Sometimes it's just a zigzag line that they put through. So I think that's a really important uh, component. If you live on a ravine to figure out where that property line is and how you can work together. Can you shout it? Yeah. Is your answer the same for Lake Bluff? Does Lake Bluff also monitor the ravines? I don't know. Um, I do know that Lake Bluff's done some great projects with George Russell over the years, and I've seen presentations on those. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of Lake Bluff as much as I do with Lake Forest. Do we have any other questions? Well, if you do come up with anything, feel free to stick around for the last 10, 15 minutes. We'll leave the building open, so if you haven't seen the exhibit just yet, you can go and pop in and have a look. Uh, just as a reminder, it'll be here until May 17th. Be on the lookout for the recording of this program, maybe within the next uh, one to two weeks. But besides that, thank you uh, for everyone for attending. Thank you to our members for making programs like these possible with great guest speakers like Ryan. And uh, Ryan, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. Thanks for coming.